If you ever thought about using Docker for your projects, this is the series for you. I wanna show you the fundamental ways to start using Docker right now so that you can bundle up your application and move it around as you see fit using containerization technology. Now, if you're not familiar with the, what this means, well, basically, it's so we can take our app, whatever programming language we're working on, and our code, combine them together so they can move around a lot more easily. Now, you might be like, oh, well, isn't that what version control is for? Well, yes and no. The thing is, version control is just the code. It doesn't actually bundle up any sort of executable that can run basically anywhere Docker can run. So if your app is containerized in Docker, your app can run. This is actually really, really cool. For those of you who have never actually pushed code into a different environment and try to set up that different environment, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy that Docker just removes all of those things. The other part is if you're trying to use a really old version of software, well, sometimes it just simply doesn't work. It's no longer supported. So we're actually gonna take a look at that as well, how you can use older versions of programming languages that you might not ever need to use, but having the ability to use Docker to actually install it and run it is something that's critical and really, really powerful. Now, thanks to Docker, the organization, for sponsoring this series. I'm really excited to bring it to you because this is the first of many. Try Docker is an exploration as to what you can do with your applications and how you can make them portable to make them that much more effective. That's really the goal here. Now, the other thing that's really cool is Docker and I decided, hey, let's do a giveaway. We're going to be giving away some Docker swag, so be sure to watch the entire video to find the link because it's only going to be to a handful of people. So be sure to watch the whole thing for that. Thanks and let's get started right now. To get started with Docker, the easiest way to do it is by using a tool called Docker Desktop. This tool itself can be installed in many different systems and it gives you a few other tools that are gonna be useful for building things with Docker and using containerization. So go to docker.com, navigate into products here, navigate down to Docker Desktop, go ahead and click that and download the one for yours and then just go through the standard system installation. After you do that, you're gonna have something like this. This is Docker Desktop. This is the user interface that comes with it. It also comes with two other key tools. One is Docker Engine, which I have running down here. Right now, I don't have anything running with Docker Engine, but we'll see that in a moment. The other one is the Docker CLI. So if I type out Docker on my terminal or PowerShell, if you're on Windows, you'll see something like this. Now I realize some of you might run into, well, some system requirements issues when it comes to using Docker Desktop. That's because, well, systems like Windows don't necessarily have all of the features and capabilities that make it super easy to install Docker Desktop. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. I just need to point out a place that you're gonna wanna look to make sure that you can. So inside of the Docker Docs or docs.docker.com, under manuals, you'll look for install Docker desktop. Now, if you're having issues there, let me know in the comments, but the main thing here is we need Docker Engine and Docker CLI. The actual user interface for Docker is something that will be really useful for beginners, but it's not required to use Docker at all. In fact, when you go into production, you're gonna use Docker desktop less and less because the production systems just don't need the overhead of the user interface because a lot of production systems just don't use a user interface. But once you're at this point, we can now do our hello world. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now that we have Docker desktop installed, let's jump into our command line. Now, in my case, it's terminal, but of course you might be on PowerShell or you might be using VS Code terminal. Either way, wherever you use your command line, go ahead and do docker dash dash version hit enter, and you should see something like this. It should actually show you a version versus something like abc dash dash version, which in my case is an error. It just can't find that command. Now, the other thing that's critical about this is the fact that, well, if I go into Docker desktop, I can see that it says engine is running. So I actually have the ability to use the Docker runtime essentially. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna run our very first Docker command, which is simply Docker run and then some sort of container name. And in my case, I'm gonna be using Nginx. Nginx has a very small footprint, but it's a very powerful web server. 
So that means we can actually see it in our web browser. So if I go to Docker run Nginx and hit enter, the very first thing that happens is it says it can't find Nginx. So it's gonna to attempt to download this from somewhere. We'll talk about this somewhere in just a little bit. But the idea is after a very short amount of time, it actually starts to run Nginx on my local machine. I didn't install Nginx at all. Docker did everything for me. Now this is one of those key things about Docker is it actually can use these packages, all kinds of containers that have all kinds of software running in them and it can do it in really fast times in some cases. So the problem with this is that I can't, have no real way to access this version of Nginx. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Nginx, you know that it actually runs on a port of 80. So if you go to your web browser and open up localhost colon 80 and try to access it, it's gonna give me nothing. And of course, you can also list out all the ports on your machine and you'll still see nothing. The idea is we want to change that from nothing to actually seeing something. We want to see the Nginx Hello World page. So to do this, we're going to close out our running instance of Docker Run the same way you close out any other application with just Control C on your machine, and that will exit out of that container running. And if I press up, I'll see that, that command again. It might take a little bit longer than what I just did, depending on what container you're running. But the idea here is we want to stop that container image to then start a new one. So we'll go ahead and do docker run and now I'll do dash p. This means I can actually publish the port itself. Now with Nginx, it has port 80. That's the default port. But on my local machine, I don't want to use port 80. I want to use port 8080 and I want that mapped to the Nginx port of 80. And then now I'm going to go ahead and run that Nginx again. Now, this might be very confusing to you, and over time, it'll become less and less confusing, I promise, because you'll have more experience with it, but just leave it like this for now, and go ahead and run it, and what we'll see now, if I go back into my web browser, I can actually now go to port 8080, because that's the port that I decided I wanted to map, and hit enter, and there you go. Hello World with Nginx is now available. Congratulations, that's super exciting. But before I go any further, I wanna just do it again. I'm gonna go back into the terminal and I'm gonna open up a new window with command in or control in, depending on what you're on. And I'm gonna go ahead and just run docker run dash P. This time I'll do 81 and we'll do 8180 to port 80 once again, the same port the container expects, but this is gonna be my local host port. I run it again and what do you know? I can open up my web browser, I can go to localhost and I can go to 8180, hit enter, and there's Nginx right there running again. And you know what? We could do it one more time. Docker run, and this is gonna be port 3000 now to port 80, and Nginx once again, and then now I go into localhost 3000, and what do you know, there's Nginx again. So what we see here is, because of Docker, I have three instances of Nginx running. Now I can absolutely modify how Nginx works to make sure that it does something different, right? We could totally look at that, but it's kind of very basic. Nginx itself has not that many features and it's probably not that exciting to just change a single web page. What would be more exciting is to have a more robust one. But before we do that, I wanna talk about where Nginx actually came from. Like where did it just pull that image? Like it said, it couldn't find it, it pulled it down. Let's take a look at that right now. Now we're gonna take a look at where all of the Docker images are stored by default. So the first thing I wanna do is actually close out all of those instances of Docker and Nginx running, and I'll control C out of the single one, the very first one that we we're working on. And then I'm gonna go ahead and jump over into hub.docker.com. This is called a Docker container registry or container registry for short. Now this is where all of the pieces of any given Docker container image is stored. So if we do a search for like Nginx, the one we've been using and do something like that, we get an official image. So this means that Docker, the organization itself, actually sponsors this image to make sure that it is the correct one. It's the official image of Nginx. That doesn't mean there's not a lot more, but the idea being that we can actually look for all kinds of software on here. So like for instance, Postgres, you can also look for that database service. And once again, we see an official one. But if we look at the search, there's also other 
container images of the same kind. And something I have is CFE Nginx. If you do a search for that, you'll see the Coding for Entrepreneurs Nginx version or a slightly modified version that we're gonna look at in just a moment from the actual Nginx itself. This is a modified one, as in it's a lot like what you may have seen before. So one of the things that you'll see on every single image is this Docker pull command. So when you start exploring more, you'll see that Docker pull command, and that actually gives us a lot of information about any given image. So like Python, for example, you see Docker pull Python. If you go into tags, you will see Docker pull Python colon latest. There's a lot more we'll discuss about that in a moment, but for now, we're gonna go ahead and try out the CFE Nginx image. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and copy that pull command, and I'm gonna go into my terminal here, and I'm just gonna paste it in and hit Control C so I don't actually run it, but there's the command that I wanna run. Well, it's almost the same thing as Nginx. I designed it specifically for that, just to see a different look, a modified version of Nginx, just so you can see how easy it is and how possible, but also how easy it is to just run a third-party container image altogether. And so what we have here is my username on Docker Hub slash the actual container image that I gave it on the repository itself. And I can go ahead and hit enter. And once again, it can't find it, so it's gonna pull it down. It's actually gonna run this Docker pull command for me. And it's also gonna default to the latest tag. We'll talk about those things another time. But the idea here is I have basically the same output from Nginx, but if I go into 8080 once again and refresh in here, I now have a much different look at the Nginx page, this, this simple hello world page. But now we have two concepts under our belt. That is the Docker Hub registry, the container registry where you can store container images. We can as individuals, companies do it, and then also Docker does it as well. And then we also have a very simple way to run these container images as long as they are public and really easy to use. So what we wanna do now is actually start making our own container image. We wanna understand this process while also understanding how Docker containers work in general. If you think of a Docker container, a lot like a virtual machine that's portable and often much smaller, you're on the right track. So in this one, we're gonna take a look at Debian, a Linux distribution, so we can actually treat our container a lot like you might with a virtual machine. Now Debian, of course, is what builds up Ubuntu, so you could always use Ubuntu if you wanted to, but I just wanna go with Debian just to make it simple. Both of them will work. Now the idea here is we wanna use the latest version of Debian. Now what you could do is the actual Docker pull Debian, that most likely will give you the latest version. But if you go into tags on there, in Docker Hub, of course, and just do a quick search for colon latest, what you will find is likely the latest one, or, or maybe not colon, but just latest. You'll see that latest tag, and then that will give us the Docker pull Debian latest, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, and I'm gonna bring it into my terminal. Of course, I need to close out Nginx, and I'll clear this out, and I'll paste the Docker pull Debian. Now, if I actually run that command, what it's gonna do is it's gonna download that image for us. It's gonna pull it. We saw this before when Nginx didn't exist and we attempted to run it, it actually downloaded and pulled it, right? Makes sense. So what we wanna do is we wanna run this, this image now with Docker run Debian. Now before with Nginx, we actually exposed a port, right? We did port 80 to 80, but a virtual machine image, a any sort of Linux based image you don't need to expose a port right off the bat. Instead, what you can do is you can use an interactive terminal, which is dash IT, and then you would use the bin slash bash command. So this command right here will be called on this container image after it starts running. So this command is very similar to like using SSH. So if you think of removing all of this, let's say for instance, SSH my user at my virtual machine, and then you did something like bin slash bash. It's kind of similar to that, right? But of course, we're gonna go ahead and just run the Docker command and hit enter. And what this will allow me to do is go into what seems to be a virtual machine. If I list things out, it has all of the makings of a Debian Linux instance, which is great. That means that I can actually install 
any sort of software that I want that's open source. I go to install Nginx, but what I'm gonna install is Python. I wanna see what version of Python that I can look at. So we don't actually need to use sudo in here. We can just use app git install and then Python 3. If I hit enter, it can't find this package. So it, again, if you're familiar with Debian, if you're not familiar with Debian, you have to update the system from time to time. So what we do is up apt git update, and then we run our install. So the update goes first. This just updates all of the different package options that we have. So then I can do apt git install Python 3. I can hit enter, and it's gonna ask me if I wanna install this. It takes more disk space. I'll go ahead and say yes and it's gonna download and install Python 3, which we can verify just by typing out Python 3. We go into the Python shell now. So what we've done is we used our terminal to use the Docker command to go into a bash script, uh, bash, um, to go into a bash runtime and then to run Python 3 and then to print out hello world and hit enter and there we go. So this is great in many ways, but it's also flawed as well. So with that still open, still running, let's go ahead and open up a new terminal once again, and we'll do docker run and that Debian again. So we'll do dash IT Debian colon latest, and then bin slash bash again, going into another bash shell. I'm gonna go ahead and type out Python three, hit enter, and I get this command not found. This is a little frustrating if you're familiar with virtual machines in SSH. This feels a lot like, oh, I just SSH'd back into this same virtual machine. But you actually didn't. You went into a brand new instance. It spawned a new instance that didn't have Python 3 already installed. So this is a very simple like way to solve this, as we'll see in a little bit. But the point is that every time you run a container, it treats it as a new isolated environment for that. In other words, it's stateless. It's not gonna rem remember that you installed Python 3 on this other container because it's gonna start fresh from specifically this container, that container with that particular tag. This is also true for Nginx, right? So let's take a look. If I did docker run dash IT Nginx latest and bin slash bash, I can hit enter. And what do you know? I'm actually in the Nginx version the Nginx container, and once again, I can try and do Python 3, and once again, it's gonna fail. So you might be like, oh, well, why don't I do docker run dash IT Python dash latest, and bin slash bash, hit enter. What do you know? It can't find the latest image itself, but it's gonna sure heck is try to download it from the Docker Hub. And so what we can also do then is go back into Docker Hub and do a quick search for Python. In there, we will see that there's an official Python image, because of course there is. Python is one of the most popular open source programming languages there is. And if we go into tags here and do a quick search, or right at the top, we see that there's latest there. Now, of course, there's other versions of Python as well, but before we look at that, let's go back into our terminal. And we've got the Python image in here now. If I type out Python 3, what do you know? It's already installed and it's not 3.11 like it was when we installed it from Debian directly, which is also really cool. So I can actually exit out of here or once again, I can open up another terminal window and do docker run dash IT Python dash latest and do our bin slash bash. And once again, I can actually write out Python 3. I, I spelled latest incorrectly, so lastest is not right, but latest is, and then we can go into that Python shell again. And once again, I can exit out of it. And what I can also do is exit out of the shell. Instead of doing bin slash bash, I can just type out Python 3 as the command. So it goes right into that Python shell. Now I wanna point out that my local system does not have that version of Python 3. It has 3.11, it doesn't have 3.12. So this is showing me that not only do I have this isolated Python environment, but I can do it many, many, many times. And my local machine may or may not have Python installed at all. In my case, it does have Python installed, but yours might not. So Docker really is that, that minimal virtual machine, except now we can have the ability to use all of these third-party packages in a very similar and repeatable way. 
Now this is cool and all because these are already built container images that we can really experiment a lot with. But what's gonna be much better is when we actually start using our own container images. But before we do that, I wanna just show you one more advantage of using third-party container images or pre-built ones. And that has to do with legacy software. I have so many container images running right now, so let's go ahead and clean them up by going into Docker Desktop and quite literally just selecting all of these things and hitting stop. That will stop all of those containers from running, even if you were currently working on them. So of course, be careful when you go and do this. But the idea being that every once in a while you wanna do this cleanup process where you stop containers that you're no longer using. And in fact, you can even delete those containers that you're no longer using as well. You can also go into all the container images in here and delete them as well, because you might not need those again. So doing this on a regular basis or pruning your system is a good idea. I will show you the command for this inside of Docker uh, on the terminal as well in the near future. Uh, but for now, what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at legacy software. So if we go into Docker Hub and into Python itself, and we search for Python 2.7, now this version of Python is no longer supported on any modern machine. In fact, the last push, the last container image was built four years ago, just about. And so what we wanna do is we wanna actually use this container image. This has to do with the portability of Docker and the isolation of Docker. So typically speaking, if I were to install Python 2.7 in this case, onto my local machine, it might cause issues or it might not even be able to be installed on my Apple Silicon Mac. It also might not be able to be installed in the future ever again. But with containers, we can go back in time to historical runtimes, in this case, historical Python 2.7, and we can actually attempt to run it. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and I'm gonna bring it into my terminal window here. I'm gonna open a new one and I'm gonna paste that in. So what this is gonna allow me to do is to download that old image version. 2.7 is very old and it lost support a long time ago, but it might be something that some of your old historical code has to use, or perhaps your, your team is starting to adopt a new version of Python, but before they can, we need to make sure that this can still run. Or maybe they're going towards Kubernetes and you have to modify a version of Python 2.7, an application that's still running on 2.7, you need to modify it so it actually can run. Now notice this is actually fairly big of a container image, uh, which we can also review in Docker Desktop itself. We see that it is almost a gig, so it's pretty big. I don't know if you necessarily want to always do this, but now the idea, of course, is being that we can run into here and do Docker run the interactive terminal again of that container image with the tag itself, and then we can do Python itself. We don't need to write three or two there. We can just write Python. And there I've got Python 2.7 in here. And I can do the ridiculous old print statement of hello world, where it's not a function, it just has these spaces and everything. And there you go. Now we have a historical version of Python running on your local machine. And you can have this running anywhere else that you might need. Now I don't recommend using Python 2.7. Of course, that's not the point of this. The point of this is to show you that yes, you can use old runtimes that are no longer working. And this is true for your old container images as well. If it can run on Docker, if it runs correctly on Docker, it can almost always run on Docker. Sure, that might change in the future, but this was built a while ago to run on Docker and it can still run on Docker today. This is 2023 right now, but when you get into 2024, 2025, that will still be able to run, assuming that it's available on Docker Hub or some sort of container registry. So that's actually really, really cool. Now, of course, if you look for, let's say for instance, Python 2.6, you might not find that container image. You also might, it really depends. Somebody else might've built it out there and you could probably get away with using a really old version of Python as well. So like, uh, Bitnami is a pretty well-known publisher. Let's go ahead and look for Python 2.6 in there. Doesn't have it, right? So even older versions of Python might not be available. So yet another reason that you might wanna build your own container images now, so that if in the future you need to go back to them, you will have that container image built with that, that software that's available uh, at that time. So it really helps us future-proof our applications as well. 
as we might ignore them over time. Hopefully you don't, but you might ignore some of your software over time and it goes stale and then certain versions are no longer available. So that's where our containers can really shine as well. Now we're gonna go ahead and create our very first container image. We're gonna build it using the docker build command. Now we're gonna do this based off of Debian so we can see just generally some of the features of how to build various container images ourselves. And it's gonna be following a pattern that's not a whole lot different than what we've already seen. Now I'm gonna be doing this by using Visual Studio Code, so download a text editor of some kind. In my case, it's VS Code, and I'm gonna go ahead and create my project in here. So what I wanna do is I wanna open up a new folder in my project, go into dev here, that's where I keep all of my projects, and I'm gonna create a new folder called try docker. And then I wanna save this one as a workspace as try docker. Great. So what we wanna do here is we're gonna create a new file called a docker file. Now VS Code has a lot of features for Docker, which is why you see the little Docker logo there. And then I also have a third party plugin that you can get from the extensions marketplace to help you as well. So by all means, look for the Docker extension from Microsoft directly. Now in this case, what we wanna do is create a Docker file that installs Python 3 for us. So basically running what we did before, which was Docker and we ran, or actually we pulled Debian and latest. And then in there we did docker run dash it and it's Debian uh, la latest bin slash bash. And then we ran apt git install Python 3 or actually before that we did apt git update and then we did that installation. And we're gonna add one more command in here which is gonna be Python 3 dash m HTTP dot server and something like 8080. Cool, so that's what we want to have happen essentially. And the Docker file is how we do that. This is how we can create our container based off of roughly these criteria. Now the Docker run part is not actually what we need. We won't use that command until we attempt to run our own container image as we'll see. But it's gonna be something more like docker run dash it CFE dash pi bin slash bash or something along those lines. That's actually what we wanna to work towards. So the very first thing that I need to do is I need to tell Docker what container image I'm gonna be using for my new container. So to do that, we'll do from, and what do you know? We already have a container image that we looked at. So I'm basically saying, hey Docker, copy this container image and I'm gonna go ahead and modify it. That modification is gonna be running apt get update, then running our installation of Python 3, and then the final thing will be our command that we want to run when we run this container, <laughs> which sounds funny. Uh, but basically, if I just ran that container without bin slash bash, what's the default going in there? This bin slash bash takes over this right here when I actually do the interactive terminal. But you wanna have a container running because actually what we're gonna use is not bin slash bash, but instead we will publish a port of our local port of 3000 to what do you know? The container port of 8080. So that's where those container ports come in. Like I said, we'll see this a lot. Um, so now let's go ahead and actually build this container image. This is about as simple as they come. This is certainly not production ready, but it is about as simple as they come in terms of a Docker file. So let's go ahead and run this and let's go ahead and build our container image. Now to do this, we use a command called docker build. Now, if you just ran docker build, you might actually have it run or you might have an error. So since we are in the same location as a docker file, docker build will automatically use that docker file or you can declare it directly. So you could do docker build dash F docker file. Then we wanna tag it ourselves with dash T, CFE dash pi, for example, like I said uh, up here. I could also add an additional tag to it, like ABC or latest or one, two, three or whatever. I can absolutely tag it with that colon, very similar to like we saw with Debian latest and the different version of Python as well. So this is gonna to attempt to build that actual Docker file with that tag, and then if I do dot period, it's gonna be in the same folder that it's in. Of course, I could also do my path to another dir or something like that, 
if I wanted to build this somewhere else or run this build command somewhere else. But I'm gonna run it right here. Now I wanna emphasize that this build command gets more simple as we move further and further down the line of using Docker. But I wanna show you it because it's still a critical command to know and to understand and to use. So let's go ahead and run this now. So we've got our Docker build run. And so what's gonna happen here is it's now creating a local version of our Docker command itself, right? So what we've got here is we've got a Python 3 did not install. So we want app git update. Let's go ahead and actually chain these together. Oh yes, I see why. Um, so the problem here is it says, do you want to continue, yes or no? When I went to go and install Python 3, I need a little flag in here called dash Y. If you're familiar with Debian, if you're familiar with Linux, this is how you can automate installing with app git. And Docker just showed us that that, that was a problem um, that I just totally overlooked. But now that it's solved, let's go ahead and run that build again. And now it actually built that container image and it did it really fast. It did it really fast for a couple of reasons. One of them being that Debian itself was already on a local machine. The other one being that it starts to cache these results, which is really nice. So it caches the different layers that come in with Docker, as it says right here. Now I actually tested mine, so yours might not say cache yet, but in this case it does. Cool, so if you ran it again, in other words, it will say cache or it should. So at this point, now I can actually run my server itself or actually run this container image. And once again, I have it up here, which I will also bring in the build command, which was simply docker build, dash F docker file, and then dash T of that tag, and then period for the local directory. Now we can go and run it just like this. So I hit enter to run. Having that port published by local port to the container port is important. Notice it's not showing me anything. It's not saying, oh, it's running at port 8080 or port 3000. That's because, well, I used a very simple command here. So what we can do is on our local machine, I can go to port 3000 and I can see, well, it shouldn't, it might say welcome to Nginx with, with the uh, caching in your browser. But if I refresh in there, I see a directory listing for all of this stuff. This is the root of the Docker container image itself. So now if I were to go into that container with Docker um, and then run dash IT and then again CFE pi and then bin slash bash hit enter and I list things out. These files right here are the same ones we're seeing right here. So Python is just allowing me to see it's exposing the entire you know, files that are in here that you can see for this entire user. You can see bin, you can see everything that's available in there. Now this is actually really useful for when we need to add files to this container image, which we will do right now. Now what I wanna do is bring in some of my code into this container image, some of my local files in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new folder called app and I'm just gonna put a file in here called hello world.txt and I'll go ahead and say hello world. Great. So back into my Docker file now, what I can do is I can actually copy these files. I can do copy and let's do dash slash app to dash slash app. So the local, actually we'll change it to app dash copy. Let's just do that and we'll see what that does. So let's go ahead and build it. I'm gonna exit out of the running container image. And I also wanna close out of my server that's been running. In fact, I might need to use Docker Desktop to stop the container itself. So inside of here, I'll just go ahead and select all containers and just stop the ones that are running so that I can just move on to the next step, which again is rebuilding this container image by just running that same exact command. Now, if this were an actual new version, then I would change it to being something like colon v2 or something like that, I would actually start to tag it differently. But since we're still learning, we don't need to worry about that just yet. So now that I've got it tagged, a new version's in there, notice that copy's in there now, I can actually come back, run my application once again, open up the browser, and when I refresh in here, I see app-copy, I can go in there, I can take a look at my hello world.txt. 
So what we see here now is, well, the foundation of actually copying files into our container when we go to build it. In other words, the actual files you want to be on the container need to be available when we build it. That's not always the case. You can download files as well, but most of the time you're going to be copying files. So what I want to do here is I actually want to get rid of this slash app, save it. We're going to close out that container server again um, by going into Docker desktop. Let's go ahead and stop it. And we'll go ahead and build another version once again. This time it's copying the entire directory. Then I'm going to go ahead and run that server again. And now if I go into my project here, I see everything that's going on with the system, the mini virtual machine that's portable. And then my app dash copy has my entire folder from my local machine on here. So when I used dot slash app, it was copying just this folder or more specifically the contents of that folder into the destination on my container of dot slash app dash copy, which is really, really nice. But the thing is, every once in a while, we're going to have something in here that we don't want to have, which is like an ENV file. So secret being ABC, something like that. We don't want that into our built image. But as it stands right now, it's going to go in there. So let's go ahead and hit stop here again. And I'll go ahead and run it again because it should stop pretty quickly. And if I have to, I will just run another instance of it. But the idea being that we run it in here again. And now if I refresh, I've got this .env file that's coming through that I can actually download and look at. Not a good thing. We definitely don't want to do that. And so what I'm going to do is instead of trying to do all this stuff manually, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this Docker file and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the app itself. So you don't have to do that. You can keep those things as reference. I'm getting rid of it because I'm going to be using another tool that's built into Docker. I just wanted to set the stage for using that tool so that you have some boilerplate that you can work off of. Let's take a look now at Docker in it. Now I stopped all of my running containers and I removed all of the reference images for those containers. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to build a new one once again. So to do this, let's jump into VS Code into our project and we're going to run Docker in it here. We're going to hit enter and what this is going to allow us to do is to select a programming language that we might be using. Notice there's a few of them in here. The main one being that we're going to be using our Python application once again. I'm going to hit enter and it is asking me what version of Python I want to use. Now you could use the default option that comes here or you could use a different one. I'm going to stick with the default option for now. Then you're going to also do the port that you wanted to listen to. Once again, we see that port value. Right now it's at a default of 8000. I'm going to leave it in as a default of 8000. So the next one is the command we want our app to run. Now you might not be familiar with this command, so we're not going to do that one just yet. Instead, what we're going to do is Python 3 M. We're going to do HTTP dot server and then the the actual same port of 8000. So we use 8000 in there. I'll go ahead and hit enter. And what it does is it creates that Docker file for us. So let's take a look at what it creates. We go into our Docker file here. Now what we see is instead of Debian, we see Python in here and we also see the specific version as an argument and it declares it as a base to this, as in this is how it's going to start once again. But this time, instead of using Debian, it's using the already built image of Python that you can find in Docker Hub. And of course, right now, if you wanted to, you can look for a different tag like 3.12 and you can grab one of these tags if you were so interested. Like in this case, you could grab 3.112 slim, which would be basically the default if you just change this to 3.112 like that. So you can change that version basically any time and then build your container image as you see fit. Once again, you want to remember that docker build dash f docker file, you know, my tag and then period will still work. This command will still work, but we're not going to use that command. Instead, we'll use something else, which you'll see very soon. So this is basically exactly what we saw, but now we've got this new argument that comes in here, which is declared by arg, which you can change when you need to. 
Next up is some Python environment stuff that it actually sets for us, which again, this is getting closer and closer to more of a production version of Docker. Next, it gives us a work directory, a working directory. We'll see what this means in a moment. It also gives us a user that does not have privileges, right? So it does this by default, which is always recommended from Docker containers. Next up, it does this run thing of installing something from requirements.txt within Python. So when I did that, uh, the Docker in it, I actually get this warning of no requirements file found. Now, if you're not familiar with Python itself, you will be very well aware that requirements.txt is just, maybe is that Docker or is that not Docker? I, I'm not sure. But if you know Python really well, you know that that's very common in Python applications is to have a requirements file for third-party packages. So in our case, we'll go ahead and bring one in and we'll just say requirements.txt. This is gonna have all of our various requirements on here. I'm gonna go ahead and put in just Python requests, which are a very popular one itself. We'll modify this very soon, but for now, I'll just leave in Python requests. So that's what's happening here. This will cache this layer. This takes place of that run, you know, apt git update and apt git install, you know, Python 3 that we had when we did Debian. So it's gonna run this command and it's also gonna cache it just like we did there, which is what's happening here. So this is not standard, this is, this. is these two things are Docker related. This right here is Python related. Then it's gonna go ahead and switch to that user. It's gonna copy the source code. In this case, I don't actually have any code other than the Docker code. And then it exposes that porch that we had, which is optional as we saw, because I did the publish flag here. So port, uh, you know, 8080 was to 8080. We saw that before. But in this case, it's gonna expose that port and then it's gonna run the command that we gave it. Cool. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and run this. Now, notice that it says when you're ready, start by running your application with Docker Compose up dash dash build. Now we're gonna look at Docker Compose very soon, but for now I'm not going to. We're gonna go ahead and do Docker build dash F Docker file. Then we're gonna tag it CFE pi once again, and then I'll go ahead and do enter once again. So now it's gonna go ahead and build that container for me and it's gonna do all of the things necessary, including downloading that new Python image that it, it asked us and offered to us, which we can find in our images once it's actually up as far as um, our container is concerned. There's our CFE image there, our CFE Pi image. So now again, we can do Docker run and we'll do our port again of 8,000 to 8,000. We're publishing that port and CFE-Pi hit enter, and now it's actually showing me that it's starting on that port. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up that port there, and there's our actual code that came through. Notice that it did copy code again, but this time it only copied two things, it didn't copy everything. So that's actually why I wanted to show you this, is because of this docker ignore file. This docker ignore file is very similar to a git ignore file, if you're familiar with version control, but it's just slightly different and it's more about all of the default Docker related things. And of course, we can also change this, which we will, by changing what copy files we actually use. In here, we can also have something like star star slash dot env to make sure that that doesn't come through like we saw with our original one, which is actually in there by default because that's often used to store secret values, which we definitely don't wanna have. But this is Docker init. This is some of the basics of Docker init. But now what we wanna do is actually go back to what Docker init was talking about when it said Docker compose. So we can actually see just an easier way to run our application and build our application than remembering those two different commands because remembering them can get tricky from time to time. To get some free Docker swag, enter your email at this link right here. We are only allowing 500 people to enter, and then of that, only 25 people are gonna get a free shirt with free shipping. Of course, if we can't ship it to you, then we're gonna have to pick someone else, but the idea here is the first 500 to sign up will be the ones that will be in the giveaway. So thanks to Docker for providing us with the great swag. Really excited for it. Be sure to join right now. Now we're gonna go ahead and solve the problem of remembering all of the commands to run our various containers and to build them. 
So let's go ahead and open up Docker Desktop and actually delete our container images that are already in here and just run that just like that and go back into your terminal and your project. Now there was something else that came in with Docker in it and that is compose.yaml. This is for Docker Compose. The modern way to write it is compose.yaml. It used to be written docker-compose, which these are basically the exact same thing. Compose.yaml is by far the easiest way to make this happen. And so inside of compose.yaml, there's a lot of things you can read about in here, which give us way towards more and more advanced versions of Docker Compose. But the idea being is we see this services in here, a service called server. We've got a build context. And what do you know, we've got some ports in here as well. So the nice thing about this is by default, it's gonna look in here for a Docker file called Docker file. That is the default configuration. I don't even have to write it, but I did just so you're aware of it because you can use different Docker files, like if you have different versions. So if you were to copy this and do Docker file dot V2 or something like that, you can actually use Docker Compose to help you with that. Ports, we've already seen the ports. We've seen this a lot. So these ports, of course, correspond to what I wanna publish on my local machine, in this case, 8,000, and then what my container is gonna run in from that Docker file, which again is also 8,000. So let's go ahead and see how to use Docker Compose. So if I come in here and write Docker Compose up, that's it. I hit enter, this will actually build it and it will run it for me. Um, so it doesn't necessarily build it every single time, we'll see in a moment, but we do see that it's serving. So I can open this up and take a look. And what do you know, the same exact thing is happening and it's happening on my local host as you can see, just like that. So that's coming from that port. Now, if I wanted to take this down, I can open up a new terminal window, navigate where the compose.yaml is, and I can do docker compose down. This will actually take down all of my services that are written in here. So what we see here is try docker-server-1. So why is it that it has well, this server name, like I didn't actually tag it anything in particular. I can change the service name to app, for example, and then run my Docker Compose up. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna change it to try docker app one. Now, of course it knows try docker because that's the folder it's in. It's inside of the try docker folder. So it goes based off of that. And then the app name is what I put in here. So let's go ahead and say app uh, web or something like that, app-web. Once again, I'll, I'll do control C this time, which will also stop the container as well. And like we've seen before, you can also go into Docker desktop to your running containers and you can stop them there also. A lot of different ways to stop containers here. But the idea is now I changed it to uh, dash web and I do Docker compose up and what do you know? It changes it to dash web. Simple enough. The other thing that's cool about this is I can actually bring it in once again, but this time I'm gonna do app two. I have to change the port. So on my local machine, I can only have one item running on one port at any given time. But when I do change the port, and let's go ahead and make sure it's all stopped. It's still trying to stop it. So going into uh, Docker Compose. Yeah, so we'll give it a second to actually finish stopping that, uh, but now it's stopped. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than other times, uh, but if I do Docker Compose up again, it's going to run this in two places, right? So it does say that it's serving at port 8000. That's because the internal container port is at port 8000, but I do see that both of these are running. So if I go into my server here and I go to 8000 and 8001, what do you know, they're both running. Now, of course, we can make this even more advanced and we can actually change the container image itself. We can actually use public images. We don't have to stick to that. Um, and there's actually an example of it right down here with Postgres, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it for my Nginx. So I'll go ahead and say CFE Nginx, and there's gonna be image, again, coding for entrepreneurs slash CFE Nginx. And then our ports that we wanna use for this is going to be simply We'll do 3000 to port 80. And this is the same thing as that publish dash P. You know, we want our local, you know, port 
to our container port. Same idea here with this. And sometimes containers can have multiple ports. That's why this is a list here. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and save that. And I'm gonna go ahead and go back into another terminal window and I'll do Docker Compose up once again. I didn't take it down this time. I just hit Docker Compose up. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna actually start building out my container image for me. Now there's actually a little bit better of a way to do this, but one is running CFE Nginx because the other is already running. So I don't need to run it multiple times, right? So this Docker Compose up is running two apps actually. And then this one is running just a new one, which kind of is giving us a little bit of a mess. So instead of having all these things running, we're gonna just go ahead and do Docker Compose down to just bring everything down, stop both versions, stop the app, stop the Nginx, and then we'll bring it back up. So what is happening here is Docker Compose, the command of Compose and Compose.yaml is actually orchestrating these containers for us. It's making us run them. And it's also remembering the context as to how we need to run them. It's remembering all of that thanks to Compose.yaml. And we can do it all the time. We can do all sorts of really cool things with it, uh, including bringing things down. I can bring things up and I can run it in the background with the detach mode with dash D, or I can just leave it up like that. So now it's showing me both of these things running as we see here. So on port 3000, I should be able to see that CFE engine X one. And then on port 8000, I should be able to see the directory listing one. Great. So what's happening here too, is it's also building this little micro network where these two applications could communicate with each other which is what this, this is actually talking about in here with the database. You can actually use Docker Compose to run those database instances for us. Now that's getting us a little bit too, like that's getting us down the line of something a little bit more complicated than what we'll cover right now. But what we wanna do is we wanna go back to the basics of Docker Compose and we just really wanna focus on the app itself and the build process so that I can actually put in a proper Python web application in here and I wanna use Docker Compose to do it, and I want it to be done in a way that's native to Docker itself without having a bunch of things that I have to remember, but rather just two things, which I think is also pretty cool. So let's take a look at Docker Watch now. Now Docker Compose and Docker have a lot of features that we're just not going to cover. But one of them that I think is really important is a newer one called Watch. Now, before we jump into that, I want to remind you that Docker is really good at remembering the configuration to build and run our containers or just run our containers, as well as to orchestrate more than one container at any given time. And it kind of puts these things all together, which is really nice for us. So what you might find yourself doing a lot when you run Docker Compose is to do Docker Compose up in detach mode. So actually put it in the background. So it's just always running. And so that when you actually come into your application, you can go into, you know, localhost 8000 and your application's there. When you restart your computer, your application is going to be there and running, which is really cool. But one of the challenges with that is like, how do I actually build the container when I need to make changes to it? So the hard way or the longer way to do it is just to do Docker build or Docker compose build and then the container name. So in this case, or the service name is app web and you can hit enter and this will actually rebuild that container for you. Or what you can use is Docker compose and watch. So right now we don't actually have watch configured just yet. So let's go ahead and configure it. So inside of our services here, I'm actually gonna first off take off Docker uh, compose down. I'm going to bring everything down. And then in my services here, we're going to do a new configuration for develop. And what we want in our develop is we want a configuration for watch. Now there are a couple of actions that you can have. One is syncing your files. One is rebuilding your files. In the case of a Python application, or at least the one we're going to be working off of, we're going to be rebuilding our files. Now, what happens when you use something like Watch, whether it's in Docker or something else, is it's often gonna look at a specific folder. Our case is no different. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a folder called app. So what it's gonna do then is we want to 
watch that folder. So that's gonna be the path argument that we put in. It's gonna watch that folder of app. If I called it SRC, then in here I would call it SRC. It's really up to you on how you go about doing that. Then we create we create a target for that application in our container itself. So I'm gonna call it app copy just for now, and we'll change these paths to more conventional paths here very soon. But this is now our Docker watch command. So what I wanna do then is I wanna bring Docker Compose up and we'll have that running. And so there we go. I can now go into that service and there's that directory listing, great. Now I'm gonna go ahead and actually cancel that out. I want this to be in detached mode so that it's always running. So I'll go ahead and let that finish for just a moment. Okay, with that stopped, I'll put it in detach mode again. So now it's running in the background and I wanna be able to rebuild it at any given time. So let's go ahead and do Docker Compose Watch now. So now with that running, it's always gonna be looking in this SRC folder. So if I create, let's say main.py, it's automatically gonna start rebuilding that container image right away. If I do print and something like hello world, save it again, then it will trigger a new recreate Maybe not necessarily right away. So actually there it goes, it goes right away. A few seconds later, it actually starts to recreate the next version. But of course, if we look at our application itself, well, there's my SRC folder and there's main.py, right? So it's actually coming through on the application itself. And the weird thing is if we look in compose.yaml, the target was app slash copy. So let's actually see what's gonna happen inside of the container itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter another container shell. So let's change our container image here. And you might remember that we did docker run-it to get into the container shell. Another thing we can do is docker execute when a container's already running. And in the command line, we can use docker ps to see what's running. Or of course we can go onto the docker desktop and get the image container that's running, the container ID right here. So I can do docker execute-it that container ID and go in that way. Or I can use Docker Compose, execute, and then the service name, which makes it really easy to just jump in to that specific service and then hit enter. Oh, whoops, we need to have our dash IT and bin slash bash again. And there we go. So we're now into that container image. If I list things out, my SRC's in there. If I go back and look for app you know, it's just not there. It's not actually coming through as far as the correct target is concerned. It's going based off of the Docker file. So it's actually copying based off of that. Uh, so basically we want these things to actually match to what's actually happening. So in my case, I wanted to go from SRC to slash app. So we'll save that. And then in my Docker file itself, um, it's still copying the same stuff, but now I want SRC as well, right? So I want just that folder nothing else, I don't need anything else in there. So let's go ahead and exit out of here. I'm gonna do Docker Compose down once again, because now I've, I made a number of changes to the Docker file and the Compose file, so I will want to update them. I might have not needed to bring it down because of those changes, it might have been fine, but I wanted to bring it down just to make sure everything was flushed out and I was able to just have all of the sort of baseline actions in place and ready to go. So with this in mind, once again, I'll do up and then dash D. So that's in that detached mode again. And I think Docker Watch is still going. It looks like it is. Great. So that means then in my you know uh, main.py, I'll go ahead and add in a few hello worlds in here. And then I'll go back into the browser itself. I'll refresh in here. And what I shouldn't see is these things in here in the very near future, right? It should only be main.py if everything was done correctly. And there it is. So there's that code. So of course, now we need to turn this into an actual application that I can use, but I wanted to build this baseline so you understood little by little what's actually happening with Compose and with the Docker file itself. So this local folder is the same in both places. And then the target is slash app. The reason that works in our Docker file, even though I don't have the target here, has everything to do with this working directory. Since I declared this working directory, my Docker file, everything after it basically moves into that working directory. The one thing I didn't have to actually copy was requirements.txt because of how this mounting works. If I didn't use this mounting, I would have to copy it over and or maybe run Python 
um, you know, manage, you know, the pip install later. In other words, you can absolutely copy requirements.txt uh, into requirements.txt just like that. You can do that same idea and this would actually add that in. And of course, if I save it, uh, watch won't necessarily watch that file, uh, but let's go ahead and just change main.py. Let's see if it actually does save it a little bit here in our requirements.txt and go back into the root. In a moment, we hopefully will see requirements.txt because my Docker file changed, but it's certainly possible it didn't, but there it is, it's right there. Fantastic, so uh, we now see how effective this watch command can be while we're developing out our containers based off of our code itself. So now what I wanna do is actually change this code to be an actual functional Python application code um, and then modifying our Docker file just a little bit, but leaving all of the Docker compose things in place, the actual compose file and the watch file and change nothing else. Let's take a look at what that does. Now we're gonna take a look at what it'd be like to actually start developing a proper application. In our case, it's gonna be Fast API, which is a very popular Python web framework. Now, even if you don't know Python that well or have never heard of Fast API, these things are actually fairly straightforward to get started now that we're at the point that we are, which we basically have a place to put our code, and then we also have a, well, Python built in to the Docker container that we'll be able to run it. So to do this, we have a few modifications that we'll need. First off, the Docker file itself, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this copy requirements.txt. I no longer need that because I'm just gonna update requirements.txt directly. Now, as a reminder, this is very Python specific. So any sort of Python application would put the requirements to run that Python application inside of requirements.txt. If you're familiar with Node, it's package.json. There's a lot of different ways to track different third-party dependencies for your applications. Now, before you go much further, you might be thinking, hey, can I actually run these installations just directly in the Docker file? And the answer is yes, of course, you actually are doing it right here. Even if you're not familiar with Python, that's what's happening. Python is installing those requirements. Now, there are more Python specific things that we could do to op further optimize this Docker file, like using a virtual environment, but that's not something I'm gonna cover at this time. Instead, what we're gonna do is just make a practical application that ends up running. So first things first is I want requirements.txt to be followed by my develop watch command. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this same exact thing. And then instead of it being rebuild for the SRC folder, I'm gonna have it rebuild for requirements.txt. And again, we can have it targeted out there to make it go into there as well. But the idea is if requirements changes, I want this to be rebuilt. And it looks like it's gonna do that. So every time I save this, it probably trigger a new rebuild and that's exactly what's happening. So let's go ahead and actually go into FastAPI's website and navigate down to the requirements itself. So FastAPI has two primary ones, which is the FastAPI package itself and uvacorn. You can use uvacorn standard as well, but I'm just gonna use uvacorn. And then there's one other one that we will need for this as well. And so inside of my requirements here, I'll put fast API, I'll put uvacorn, and then I'll put gunicorn, which is the other web server gateway interface. So gunicorn and uvacorn work together to give us asynchronous Python or an asynchronous web application with fast API, which is really nice. But once I have the requirements being you know, tracked, I can actually run those installations so now I can feel pretty confident to actually build out my main.py to build out the actual application. So once again, I'll jump into the FastAPI documentation, go into create it, copy this, and just paste it into main.py. As soon as I save it, everything changes, right? So it recreates everything and all that. So the key thing to note here is this app. Now, when it comes to using gunicorn, we need to know where this app declaration is. This is true for a lot of different Python web applications. If you're using something like Django, you're gonna be looking for the application declaration. Um, if you're using Flask, it's gonna be app most likely. But the idea being is when you use Gunicorn, you use something like main.app. So in my case, main.py is that main right there. If this was called main itself or called app itself, it would then be app.app. Like, so if, let's just rename it. Let's just take a look. That would then be app.app. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take it back to being main.app because this makes a lot more sense. 
Now, sometimes you might have to include the folder itself. And actually it's not main.app, but rather main colon app. And then you might have to do source dot main colon app. That would be true if our requirements file was slightly different. If we didn't do this copy slash source to that folder, then we would have to change it. In other words, this directory listing, if it had the SRC folder here, then my command would need SRC dot main colon app. Cool. So this is going to be the command I want to use, but I also need to use something called a worker class to have U UVacorn support. So it's uvacorn.workers.uvacorn worker. So that's another part of the command. And then we want to bind it to the local host, which the local host in this case is actually binding it to the container itself, not to our local host just yet, but to the container itself at some port value. So in my case, it's gonna be 8,000 because that's what we have in our Docker expose right there and there, but more importantly in Docker compose as well. So what I can do is I could update my Docker file with that command, or I could use this same command and bring it into compose.yaml right in here. So we do command and then we can paste it in here. We actually do line by line or actually like argument by argument, kind of like this. So we use little bits and pieces of it. So it's actually separated out slightly. This isn't the only way to do it, but it is a fairly common way to do it when you write it directly in Docker Compose. So the nice thing about this is I can actually change the port right inside of Docker Compose. So if I save this, everything might actually restart. It also might not. So let's go ahead and force it to restart with Docker Compose up and hit enter. So this will actually recreate it. I don't have it in detached mode, so it may or may not actually work correctly when you do it again. But notice I never took it down and it is still attempting to recreate it. So right off the bat, I get this error, no module named SRC. So that's why sometimes I don't actually opt for just detached mode. But another thing you can do is do Docker Compose logs and you'll see the same sort of idea if something's not actually running. And you know, once again, inside of the uh, Docker desktop, you can also see if something's running and you can investigate more in there as well. So what's the SRC? Well, it's this right here. That part is not correct. So let's go ahead and make it correct. So really simple in Docker Compose, we can make it correct. And again, Docker Compose and we'll go ahead and do up and then detach mode. It started. Notice my watcher, my Docker Compose watcher is still running. So it's been running that whole time. So now I should be able to go back into 000008000 000, on my local computer, refresh, and what do you know? There is our Python application running from Docker bound to our local machine. It was really just that simple. So if I actually wanted to have this command in my Docker file, that's actually what I recommend you do is the default command is the one that you're gonna actually use to run your application. So I'll go ahead and sort of reverse the order that we had here. So go ahead and copy this and bring it in here. Now you can actually use very similar syntax in here. Uh, and there's actually a lot of different ways to have a command run inside of Docker. Uh, like you can have an external script that runs. So if you need to run migrations or something like that, when it actually starts to run, that might be something you do elsewhere. But that's not something we're gonna cover right now. Okay, so with the Docker, comp the Docker file changed, notice that it's not actually recreating when I save it, which I am trying to do. Um, once again, I could put that in compose.yaml or I could just run Docker Compose up and it looks like it's actually not going to recreate it. So let's go ahead and go into main.py and just save that. This time it should actually recreate it for me. So then in compose.yaml, I can get rid of this command right here. And let's go ahead and run Docker Compose up again. Again, it's running. I refresh in here. I don't know if the actual command made a difference here just yet. So I'll go ahead and bring it down and then we'll bring it up because we actually refreshed a good amount with the Docker Compose file that it sort of makes sense to be able to bring it down and then to bring it back up. Uh, so yeah, once we do that, then we will have everything in place and there we go. So, you know, once again, in Compose.yaml, we, if we needed to investigate what's going on with that, what what's actually inside of the code itself, I could then come in and use the different command instead of gunicorn, I could just come in here and do the Python 3 HTTP server to see 
exactly what's going on as far as the code is concerned in the actual, uh, you know, oh, we could probably put this in as a string just like that. And so we run it again. Now it's gonna go recreate it. And this is just if you need to see what that directory, what files are coming through, what's being copied, and all of that inside of your application, because you might wanna do that from time to time. But we now see a practical Python application. We also see a couple different ways on how we can run that application based off of the Docker file, based off of the compose file. Um, and of course, if you remember back to when we did our Docker compose um, run, or rather Docker run dash IT, and then we did the image name, and then we did some command here. So some command here. Uh, that's not a whole lot different than what we're doing with this and what we're doing with this. So we actually have a lot of options inside of Docker on how we can actually run our applications that are inside of those, uh, you know, those Docker containers. It's pretty nice. And now we have the foundation also to start building out our applications significantly more. Now we're gonna jump into our Python container and we're gonna take a look at various environment variables. So open up your terminal window, whether it's in VS Code or on the terminal program and go ahead and run docker compose exe-it and it's gonna be your app itself, which we called app-web, app-web and then we'll do bin slash bash, okay? So this exe, that will only work if your actual container is running. If it's not running, then you're gonna to have to run it and then do that. Okay, or you could just run run instead of exec or execute. So inside of here, let's take a look at some environment variables. One of them is coming directly from the Docker file itself. This Python don't write bytecode environment variable. If I do echo dollar sign and then that name, I can actually see the value for it. I can do this for the other one as well. And so these environment variables are important for our application. Now, the other thing that we need to understand about environment variables is sometimes they are secret values, as in, you don't wanna say env my pdub, as in my password. You don't wanna implement that in the Docker file. That's violating a core tenant of security. If you want a password in your environment variables, do not write it in your Docker file or in your code. So what I wanna do though, is I wanna actually still have this as a working example. So that's what we're gonna look at now. Back into main.py, I'm gonna import something called OS. Now, this is one simple way to load in environment variables. It's not necessarily one I would recommend in the long run. There's plenty other ones out there for Python specifically. The one I really like is Python decouple. But the idea here is we want to actually see what these environment variables would end up being. So the first one is we're gonna go ahead and inside of my main index page, the root here, I'm gonna go ahead and say my secret, or let's call it my pdub, and it's gonna be os.environ.git and my pdub. Typically speaking, environment variables are capitalized all the way, and then spaces are actually underscores instead of spaces. This is true whether it's Python, Node, or any other programming language. That's typically how environment variables are written. So what I wanna do is I actually wanna see these coming out. So we put it into our return response here, and assuming that my watcher is still going, I can go and take a look at that value, um, and it looks like it did not recreate it yet. Still nearly done, and there we go. So we got it at null right now. So it's not actually set is the point. So to set it, there's a couple of different ways how we can do it, but since this is going to be a secret, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create in the root of my project next to compose.yaml, I'm gonna create a .env file, not in SRC, but next to compose.yaml, just like that, and I'll call it my pdub and working. Just like that, no quotes are necessary, you can add quotes if you need to, but there we go. And then back into compose.yaml, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in the env file, so env file, and it's just gonna be dot slash dot env, as in relative to this file, it's in dot env. You probably can get away with just using dot env, but I like having it, having the relative path in there as well. Okay, so with this in mind, I might need to recreate this application. I'm not actually positive, so let's actually try to recreate it just by saving the Python file. 
just saved the Python file. I made some changes to E and V, and now I refresh in here and nothing. So that probably means that I need to actually restart my Docker Compose once again. So we'll do Docker Compose. I'll try up and then detached mode, see if that actually does anything for us. It might, it might not, because it wasn't actually um, loading this before. So uh, perhaps it won't load it now, but we'll see. So we save that, we refresh in here. It's going back to directory listing. So actually something did happen, correct? I had that command up still. So let's get rid of that, save it again, and we'll go ahead and do Docker Compose up detached mode once again. This time it should actually give us the correct values, hopefully with our environment variables as well. So let's go ahead and just let it run. And there it goes, now it is working. So if I go in to change it to something different, like one, two, three, save that, it's not necessarily going to recreate because once again, it is not inside of the watch actions. So once again, we could bring it in to the watch actions. And so this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and not put a target here, but rather just do the dot env or rather dot slash dot env. And we'll take a look at that as well. And let's run Docker Compose up again, just to refresh everything from the compose file itself. And now when the env file changes, I believe the watch will then update as well. So let's take a look. We refresh in here, there's one, two, three. Notice it is not a number, it's treated as a string by default. So you would have to account for that. That's something like Python decouple would help us with that. But now if I wanted to change it to, let's say for instance, another one, we save that. We go back into our watch command. Looks like it's not doing anything yet. This is probably because it needs to be refreshed once again, just to track everything from compose.yaml. Um, and in this case, of course, the environment variables. So we can go ahead and save that and rerun it how we see fit. But the main thing here is that we can inject environment variables in multiple ways. The One of the ways that you probably will end up doing is using compose.yaml. Um, but right now, especially with how it is currently, this is gonna be a lot more of a development compose.yaml, not necessarily a production one, because the production one might not inject it like this. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, but the point is that you can use environment variables with Docker by using the env files just like that. And so once we do that, we can refresh, there's another one. And if I change this once again, they should actually trigger out that watch command as well. Uh, and it looks like it's still running, still building it out, so it's not quite done yet. But um, the other thing is, of course, the Docker command itself can use it too. So Docker, and if we did run dash dash help, you will see that you can actually pass in a lot of different arguments in here. Uh, but one of them is the environment variables. So env file, and you can have a list of them. So, so you can have multiple env files going through. It's not always called .env, but it is most likely in this key value pair format in that way, uh, which is great. So now we have a really robust way to control our containers using Docker Compose. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you got a lot out of this. There's a topic I didn't really talk about through the series, but we actually alluded to it multiple times, and that is containers are ephemeral. In other words, we treat them as if we could just delete them at any time. That's kind of the point, is we wanna be able to build them up and delete them just as quickly. So this ephemeral nature means that things don't persist in the container. We already saw this when we tried to install Python and then reactivate it, so we actually had to build a container. So the thing is to solve this problem, there's a concept called volumes. We can attach volumes, which is basically like binding a local folder to the container, much like we bound a port to the container. We can actually do that with volumes as well. And it's something I wanna cover a lot more of right on my YouTube channel at cfe.sh slash YouTube. So be sure to subscribe there if you're not already. Now, if you haven't joined that giveaway, I do recommend you check out that link that I mentioned when it came up. So be sure to scrub through the video to find it if you haven't already, because you can get swag like this for free because I partnered with Docker. So thanks so much for them for actually helping us out with the series. And I'm really excited to bring you a lot more with Docker because it's such a fundamental tool to developers all around. Thanks again for watching. Look forward to seeing you next time.